All right, so we are here for Code Golf, like the zen of writing bad code. And first off, I want to thank our sponsors. Like, without them, this wouldn't happen. So thank you, everyone that sponsored this event. And here we go. All right, so what is Code Golf? Like, it's, it's like a puzzle. It's like a puzzling approach to solving problems. And the idea is that we want to solve a problem like the fewest characters possible. All right, so uh, just like in golf, you know, the low score kind of wins here. <clears throat> so why code golf, right? Like it's what I like about it is like a unique way to use like a skill that I already have. You know, I kind of have this whole body of knowledge around PowerShell, and you got this challenge that now you're like solving the challenge, but you're now starting to like really abuse and twist the language to do stuff it was never meant to do. Um, and it really gets to exercise your creativity. Like you get to really think about things in very different ways than you'd ever look at them otherwise. Um, and the types of problems that you're given in like code golf tend to be like good like code interview type problems. You know, they're fairly simple. You could probably do in a quick sitting to actually solve the initial challenge, and then all the work. That's when all the work begins. So. Um, and there is actually a website, code.golf, that supports PowerShell. So, like, and they've got a leaderboard, so you, you can solve the challenges, they'll run the PowerShell to validate it, and uh, they've got 70 some holes. In fact, they have lots of languages. So if you're C Sharp, Python, just a little bit of everything there um, to play with. And then leaderboard, I pulled it up just a little bit ago, because I'm, I'm 17th now. At one point, I was like, three on the list, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, and then disclaimer, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean that you should, right? Like, you know, we write good professional code. It tends to be verbose, easy to read, because you spend so much time reading code versus writing it. You want it to be easy to read, you know, good variable names, reusable, testable, all that. And code golf is none of that. <laughs> Um, I write a, well, I had a blog, I have a blog series called you know, Everything You Want to Know About Hash Tables or whatever, and quite often I'd have little tidbits, I'm like, I don't want to tell people about this because then they'll use it. <laughs> and this talk is just full of that stuff that you shouldn't be using. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into actually some code samples to see how twisted and fun we can make PowerShell. <clears throat> Let's do a quick uh, theme change here so it's easier to see on the film. We'll go. All right, excellent. All right, so then just a little housekeeping. So, in my script here, we're basically going to run through some just sample pieces of PowerShell. Um, little has to be a little, little output notation where if I'm doing this little, you know, hash symbol arrow, it's like what the output might be because I might have like several things. We're just looking at like small little output type examples. Uh, and I might describe like the number of characters for something as like this eight colon or, or like this, just so that we don't have to keep counting them each time I'm adjusting the number of, of characters. So uh, working with code golf, um, the, the tests will generally be about, around what's outputted to the host um, or just outputted, right? So you can do write host, write output, or just drop a string, right? As the output is going to count in the validation and checks for code golf. Um, and then when accessing arguments in code golf, like sometimes they'll give you a challenge of like here's like seven or a hundred things to process. Um, they're actually passed into your scripts using the args, like $args. Like that's going to have all your arguments for the challenges when they come up. And we'll, we'll use one that uses that in our testing here. And then some of them use Unicode characters, and you can just copy and paste Unicode characters around in your PowerShell. So if you have an example that says, you know, here's some flags or arrows, you can really copy and paste from the description into your, your strings and scripts to to use them. Um, all right, and if you're using the uh, VS Code, you can actually turn on 
the uh, editor render white space. So here I can see indications where there's you know white space where I would otherwise see it. Now, PowerShell actually there's a lot of white space you don't need in PowerShell, and we're going to see some kind of fun examples of that here. So, for example, like this can be just one line, right? No white space. Uh, new lines count, so that a new line, even if it's at the beginning, that's another character. So anywhere we can rob those characters in our in our in our PowerShell, uh, the better. All right. So then, math operators. This is one of the first places you can start just like throwing away spaces. So like, uh, like it's very common just to have white space and it makes stuff easy to read. But here, like, you can literally bump every number right up next to the next one without any spaces. And same for variables, right? We can just like um, string this all together quite nicely. Uh, it gets more fun when we start talking about other operators. So there's actually a lot of operators in PowerShell. Um, and I'll come back to a couple examples, but and then the pipeline, like we all know, for, you know, for each, we can just do this percent sign. Like we don't need any spaces in here at all to enumerate an array and, and dump them all out uh, and process them. All right, so the comparison operator. Here's our first fun one, right? Like you don't actually need to put spaces on either side of this operator. So you can literally just say 5-eq5, and this is valid PowerShell. And this is where they start getting kind of weird that you can actually do, you know, do this. Uh, same for just variables. Like PowerShell knows to parse this separate from the, the variable name. And, um, uh, and then you can chain these, right? So your and operators, your or operators. Like we just start mushing stuff together wherever we see spaces. Like, in fact, that's the best tip to start with is you see a space, delete it, and see if your code still works. Like, so I discovered so many things just like, I don't think I need that space. And no, I, I didn't. Um, like, yeah, there's uh, the ternary operator annoyingly needs like spaces between the, a couple spots. But other than that, I feel like um, I don't. OK, so uh, the join command, this is fun. So, you know, don't like you like join arrays and collections together with stuff. Uh, but you don't need the space between what you're joining and what you're passing in there, and even if it's like a number. So if I have a, if I want to actually put a delimiter in somewhere that's like the number zero, I can just join my array and it'll, it'll shove it right in there. And that's one of the first. It looks so odd seeing that so close, but it's, it's an operator, so we're good. Um, did you know that you could join an array on the left side? Like if I actually just want to join all the characters together with nothing in between them, I can just put, here, so let me start running a couple of these. So here, we load my array, and we just join that array. Uh, yeah, operators are fun. Uh, split. So, uh, so we can also, you know, uh, split values, right, um, anywhere, but, uh, yeah, again, so we can do, do it with the uh, like the numbers in, the, in these places. We get this beautiful flow. But we can also split on the right side as well. Like we can split all the values over here. So, like this is one of those. Just because you can do this, like don't be putting these in, in your normal scripts, right? Because somebody's gonna see that and think there's no way that's right. And yeah, but if you're on the shell, uh, the terminal, uh, sometimes it's, you can quickly uh, just you know. Pop out a couple of these. Uh, How does 99 know to split on a space? By default, it splits on a space. So that's just what split splits on if you give it nothing to split on. No, that, that's a great question. So the question was, how does this guy know to use to split on the space here? And that's. Is this for the dollar OFS built in variable? Uh, no, it doesn't take a cent from OFS. Uh, and also it trims uh, any empty entries on like the on like the incident. So if you have like space one, space two, space three, it will also remove the space without giving you a bunch of empty strings. Oh, wonderful! Nice. Oh yeah. So the, the, the combo is that we can auto trim these these values as well because the uh, split is removing them. Uh, replace. So right, we can you know 
uh, we have some values, you know, so like here's the value we're replacing something else. So if we want to remove, you know, uh, this character, we put in an empty string. Or you just say, just leave that off. Just say replace the dash and don't tell it what to put in there and it will remove it from your string. And then I keep going back to like numbers as my references here because if you can use as a delimiter in some of your tricks, you're saving a quote here and a quote here. And there's two characters you save by using a number instead of a dash or a comma in your CSV. I have, uh, CSVs are just something zero, something zero, something zero instead of commas because I can shave those two characters there. Uh, replace can be chained. So you can actually have like replace, call replace, back to back uh, with no spaces in between. Anyways, just fun weird things you can do with operators. Uh, then uh, arrays of strings. So that's another thing that uh, uh, you might have like a long list of things you need to process, right? A nice beautiful thing you'd see in your production code, beautifully indented. But maybe we, we can do it all inline. And I don't actually need to say it's an array, right? Because PowerShell knows if you put commas in there between your things, it's an array. So there's you know three more characters we drop. Uh, depending on how many things you have, we don't need the quotes. Like if you do like a write output in several words, you don't need to put quotes around them. And echo, like this is one of my favorite little hacks on the shell is I will echo several things to get them you know, in a array or in a collection without having to add quotes around every little item. So as I run this echo here, you know, we get first, second, third in the output. Um, and Depending on the challenge in the case, like maybe it makes sense to have everything like in a string and then you split it up. Um, so like yeah, here's a case where, I, where I, um, everything's in line. And again here where I'm using my zero as a delimiter. But we start looking at like multiple line strings, right? We're pretty familiar with the here string. And, um, and we just know if we're doing multiple lines of strings, you put, use the here string so, you can, so it wraps cleanly. But you don't actually need to use a here string for a multi-line string. Like strings are multi-line by default. It's just really ugly in your code and breaks easy because you can if you put your quotes in there or whatnot. But uh, this can be um, you know a fun surprise when uh, you run this. So an example, right? I've got like a multi-line string. I split on the new line as a way to convert it to an array or a collection later. Um, Pre-sizing arrays, sometimes you need an array of a certain size, right? If I just need a 20 character array, I just spit out those numbers and overwrite them potentially. But if you actually want like zero, like array of 20 that has zeros in every spot, uh, you can actually take an array of zero make times 20, you know, get 20 elements. Um, and then here, like I said, you can use a comma to delimit an array. So we can do like comma zero, that's an array of one item 20 times. So when we run this, I, I get the uh, the beautiful, you know, a dollar twenty zeros. Uh, oh, deconstruction. So here's a, uh, I, I didn't really use this much before I started doing the code golf, and I use it a lot in code golf, and I found uses um, otherwise. But so. When we sign something on the right to the left, right, over the equal sign, we can actually have multiple targets on the left. So I can do variable one comma variable two equals two items in an array, and they'll both be assigned to one variable individually. So the A goes to the first, and the B goes to the second. Uh, a great place to use this is like splitting you know, an email in half. Like I want to get my username separate from the domain. If I split, that's a two item um, array. And I get assigned to the user and domain like a whole in one nice clean line. So this is this is a handy one for your shell. Um, and then if you have like extra values, like the first one will get the first item in the array, and then everything else will go into the second variable. So if you have a trick where you want to get rid of the first thing in the list, you can assign the one to the one variable, and everything else will go to the second one. Um, we can also kind of do this with assigning nulls to a variable as well, to where I can only say, you know, first comma second equals A, 
the second variable is assigned null. Like, look how few characters that is, right? Like, if I need to get a null variable in there, um, it's at least, what, three here? And here I just had to add the comma to effectively assign a null to a variable that um, didn't need it. And then and if you want to swap variables, all right, so if something is assigned, you know, A and B on the left and right, like instead of having to like go from, I want to put the first one in an attempt because I want to get it assigned to the second and juggling them around, you can actually on one line assign them so they get swapped between the two variables. Uh, and assignments can be chained, so you can say, you know, A equals B equals C and the value, and they'll all get assigned that same, the same value in a run. And then another trick I we use quite heavily in code golf is like normally when I run you know n equals a, there's no output, right? Like so when I run this now, it's it'll do the assignment. But if I wanted to do the assignments and get the value, like I could do you know comma dollar n and I and I get the, get it in the output. But PowerShell allows us to you know when we wrap it in parentheses. Uh, in this case, when we run this, it's spitting the value out. So quite often you can you know, assign a value and use it immediately versus assign it and have a second reference that use it. Like it's, uh, um, sometimes it doesn't seem like you're saving much. Like, so like for the example is, right? So I have like uh, $n here. You're gonna say, well, that, that's two characters. This is two characters. Like did I really save any space, right? If I'm right here, but I, you're missing like the new line. So not only the new line is what I'm saving. I'm saving one character by doing it with those parentheses versus nice, clean, and easy to read. Uh, and then, like, so, we're, so we're adding one, right? Like uh, n plus one or n, you know, or, yeah, uh, n plus equals one. There's also the, from, from, our, our, uh, uh, from C++, there's like n plus plus and plus plus n. Uh, they're very similar, like they're both incrementing, but the one nuance is that if I do n plus plus, it's like it'll like use the value and then increment it. Or if I do plus plus n, it increments it and then uses it. Now there's an edge case here where, let's say, I need a certain value now versus like 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 here's an example where if I take j, I I get the value and add it to 20, and then increment it. Versus, I get the, I increment it and then add a twenty, but afterwards they're both equal to two. So like, um, if you need to like offset where the value shows up in your calculations, you can you'd, you'd want to use the plus plus before the plus plus after. Um, and then if you want the value out, right? You you get a. Um, uh, so in mathematical operations, you get the value and use it right away. But if I want to output it to the terminal, uh, that's where you'd actually want to wrap it in the uh, uh, parentheses. All right. Yes. You actually don't have to set it to zero. If you do like yap plus plus, you get one. If it doesn't already exist. If it does, yeah, yap doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> that, 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 okay, that, that's a great point. So if I have a different variable that I haven't used yet, Let's do dollar uh, m. That's not assigned. So the trip, the trick we're just saying is, yeah, if we do dollar uh, m plus plus by running it now and it's checking the value, I've got one in there now. So if I need to, ass so if I need to assign one. Um, and in the middle of an operation, uh, you can do it with a plus plus m. So I'm trying to think of had another place I could use that, but. And presumably then starting from a, an empty variable, if you did plus plus dollar m, you would get the, the output straight away. So if I do plus plus dollar h, I'll come back on, 
I can someone else play there, but I want to, um, yeah, I don't know what the nuance there is, but, uh, uh, um, but I can move on to iterations, because uh, the for loop is beautiful to get in certain values in, in certain orders, but it's so long. And uh, uh, what's clever, though, is all of these are optional. So if you need like a, a forever loop, you need to literally just do four parentheses in your value, and it'll just run that forever. Like if you have no condition there to check, or initialization, or incrementer, it's like forever, forever, ever. Uh, very similar, like, like as a comparison, like to the while one loop. Um, all right, so trying to like shrink things down, uh, we can do our for each tighter, right? We can try like the for each method, but it's still kind of long, and that's kind of end up falling down to the pipeline where. Yeah, you literally create the, uh, do the enumeration and then, and, and then pipe it. And now we're in like 12 characters. We've got the numbers one through 100 to use somewhere else. So there's many times I'll start with a larger loop, but I can fall down to this quite nicely that yeah, if we just um, pipe it over, uh, uh, this is like one of the tightest ways to, to do this loop. All right, I think I'm gonna jump over to challenge here. So, uh, I've got one here where it's basically, we've got the challenge where we're given uh, the date in year, year, dash, month, month, dash, day, day as a string. And the problem is, give it to me, give me the day of the week that that is. So in the challenge itself on the site, um, so okay, and it's really easy to get the day of the week because there's actually a property for day of the week, right? Like, so we can do like the formatted to string of, of this type that will actually give us this date. Home, whatever, Tuesday, we do the format string, but it's still longer than just using day of the week. All right, so here's a nice you know, reference when we start using this and start whittling away at how do we get this down? Because by the time we're done here, we're shooting for 16 characters to take the process from the input and, and give us the day of the week for each of these. So to work the challenge, I'm using so just some input data just to help with the iteration and, and dev testing here. And because I'm testing in, in, in my VS code, I'm actually using arg5 because args is an automatic variable. You can't assign anything to it in your session. So I'm using a different variable in my session, but I'll copy and when I paste it into the site, I'll, I'll flip it over to the S so it runs validly. So pay no attention to the, the odd fives. Um, all right, so here's a nice clean solution like you might see in something a little bit more professional, but just to prove the idea that, yeah, we can loop over everything and we get the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the output. So, all right, so we're already at like 74 characters. Uh, we can whittle up down, so we're a little bit more inline, right? So like I'm, I saw I can flip over here, but I'm casting the string use this uh, like accelerator of type of, of date time to actually convert it to a date time object. And that's what's giving me the day of the week property. And so and that's kind of like how I'm starting down this path. Sometimes you'll go down one rabbit hole and kind of step back and say, all right, now that I'm stuck, is there a different way to do this? And we'll find a different way before we're done. All right, so, all right, so we start whittling away. Uh, if we put everything on one line, all right, so I'm at 46 characters, but I've got one long line here that that does what we need to do. So here's our, 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 our real starting point to, to shrink things. All right, so we're iterating. Um, I could try like the for each method, like that's a little bit shorter. Um, it's a little bit obscure and we're not gonna end up using it, but I just the process of trying something and seeing how it, how, how it gets you to something else. But what this has given me is, right, for each, here's a script to run on the thing, which will output, we'll convert it and, and give me the day of the week. Uh, the for each method is kind of interesting in that if I break down a little bit deeper, I can actually for each and give it the, the type accelerator to convert it, and I can just give it the string that's a property and it'll output the string, or output that property. So this will give me all the days of the week, and a little bit redundant, but I could trim it down here and use this one for like 35 characters. So now, but as I'm thinking of this, oh, so okay, so is there another way for me to get all of these arguments like as just an array of dates? All right, so why don't I just try casting the whole thing as an array of dates and get the day of the week off that? Beautiful, that works. Okay, 
So how can we whittle this down more? Well, uh, for each object, uh, right, we can use our alias to you know get it shorter. As I what I want to get to is right here. So like here's a case where I know for each the alias is very few char character strokes, but we're like 33 characters piping this and getting the property. And I'm like 30, 29 right here, right? So I feel like I'm losing ground a little bit. But then I kind of remember that I don't actually need, I can actually just give it the string name of the property. And I will get that property off the objects that are passed over the pipe. So I don't actually need to wrap in a script block, I can always say a for each property name, and I get that property. So select expand property. No, just 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 do a little for each loop here. Um, and then the real magic is that you can use wildcards there. So it almost looks vulgar, but. <laughs> But it is as long as it only matches one thing in the list. Because if I do, you know, check my uh, my uh, R five zero uh, get member, right? Like there's several things to choose from, and as long as I can find a pattern that will only find a single match. Oh, no, that's not my converted one. Uh, I think I just, if I just do date, I've got something in date. Um, add something, something, day of the week, there it is. Now, it's kind of the only thing that ends in K, but my nuance is, that there is a private method that's get something underscore, like there's an accessor that actually has um, uh, the same pattern of ending in a K. So if I run just this, which I feel like it should have worked, until it complains that it doesn't, um, I was able to slip this back in there. So this is fun. Like this feels like something you might use on the shell, right? Like you're doing something quick and dirty now, you can just kind of like grab the, the one property off of a, you can check both get date and to get date. Ooh, I think you're right. So what about get date, right? So get date does conversions. And in fact, as we run this, right, okay, so we can, you know, pass as a parameter. And as I looked at it, I didn't realize it at the time. There's actually a format on there. So maybe I didn't do no, maybe I didn't even need to do all that other stuff. Like sometimes there's a simple answer sitting there, but I went through the exercise and that's Told me, okay, I gotta search a little bit deeper. And then I'm like, you know, let me just back up, rethink through things. So get date, we'll do this with the format. And the DDD is I looked it up, and that's the thing that says, give me the give me the day of the week. So from here, we can build on that. And man, that's actually super clean. But I'm at okay, so uh uh sorry, so now we're down to like 22 characters with the get date. And now here's one of those things that you've probably known but thrown away, right? Like uh it's that you don't need the get on command lines to start with get. So you can actually just say date and you'll get the date. Um, so it's just like, you know, like we got like, uh, yeah, verb. If I just type verb, I get all the verbs. So that's it's like a shadow alias. Um, and now unless there's an actual like executable or a keyword that matches that. So process doesn't work. Like get process, get process, because process is a keyword in something and it blows up. But date, there is none. So if I just type, yeah, uh, run this guy here. Yeah, I actually just run dates. You know, I get today's date. So we're there. Now I've just shaved off, yeah, those four more characters. So now I'm down to 18. And now this was so elegant, but it's actually not like the longest thing on here. So if I go back to that trick I had before and bring in that wildcard pattern match, now I'm at 16 characters of matching on the line um, with the shadow alias for gets and the uh, for each property name wildcarded. And now we're at a nice, very elegant 
you don't usually see it and see this, but this is a very elegant looking, you know, code golf solution. Many of them are like this wall of characters, but this guy here came down to just um, um, something that was like, don't be putting this like in your scripts that you're checking in, but man, when you're on the terminal working these, these are the, these are, these are the fun ones. So, so all right, so we learned a couple tricks in this that we might be able to use. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, so if I actually bounce over to the final solution where I fix that, we hop into Code Golf, the site. There is, uh, where is it? Oh, there it is. Play around. PowerShell. As we run that. So when we run it on the site, uh, down below, it'll actually show you like what the arguments are, what the expected is, and what your output is. Um, in this case, when you run it, it actually changes the dates. So you can't like just, uh, per, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, hard, hard code a certain output. Um, if you actually have a mistake in here, you know, something extra or whatever, and, and it's ran, the output is going to tell you not only did it fail, but it'll actually kind of do this little line by line thing and tell you exactly, like, okay, you've got a zero here, it's not on this right side. So it gives you the diff between the output. So when you're like whittling closer, you can get a feel and see, you know, what pieces um, need to be tweaked or adjusted to get your final solution. And then part of this is uh, there's a leaderboard over here. Now, it just so happens that in this case, this is you know the top tightest solution because I have no idea. I mean, yeah, obviously we can't get smaller than that one. Um, um, yeah. All right, so I've got one more challenge. I could probably run, run run through pieces of it pretty quick here. Um, uh, Fibonacci. All right, so this is a little bit more mathematical. Like there's a lot of like computer sciencey type problems, and the Fibonacci sequence is we're starting with like, um, what is it? It takes like two values, adds them together to give you the next one. So we we'll go, so zero, one gives us one, one and one gives us two, two and one gives us three. So basically, and it, and it kind of like increments and grows in there. And the challenge says generate the first hundred of them. So it's a pretty well known, you know, problem pattern. And um, this is like a very verbose solution that the way I'm going to solve it is I'm actually going to just keep track of the first and the second one and these like current and next variables and then I'll shove an attempt variable as I add them and swap them around. So it's like I'm counting because I want to output the first 30. I'm going to output to the tr uh, output just the value that I'm currently on. In this case, it would be zero because we're at the first loop. And then I'm saving the next value and I'm adding the current and the next together to give me the next, and then pulling the current or out of temp to save it. So the next loop, I'm kind of in this nice clean state. And um, uh, don't worry, the math actually works. Um, here, it's a little bit tighter, just so that, you know, uh, a little bit tighter variables. But as we run this, I'm getting the first, yeah, the first 30 Fibonacci numbers. So uh, the first thing is I'm like, getting an algorithm that actually works, then you start chipping away at it, and I'm, I'm like, okay, let's get rid of this temp variable. Like, maybe I don't need to shove this to the side to begin with. We can use that that other trick I was doing where, uh, where I can do the swap in line, so I can actually shove B into A, and actually add A and B together to shove it back into B. And that's effectively what I'm doing here with the temp variable, and I'm able to like get rid of that by using uh, uh, this is all, all, all in line. Okay, so we, so all right, so I've got that whittling away a little bit more. Like, okay, what if I don't have to initialize the A, right? Like, sometimes you're just assigning something to zero. Can you get away with not doing that? And uh, in this case, I do, but I still want the zero in the output. So here, I'm kind of using like the uh, null coalescing operator, right? So if A is null, give me whatever's on the right instead. But once it's initialized, once it's gone through, and like one's been added to it. It won't be null anymore. So you start using like the null coalescing, the ternary operator, like there's operators in PowerShell that you're probably, like if you're trying to be compatible with five, you're not running, that they added. 
But all of this code web, code golf site is PowerShell 7, so you can kind of use those new tricks and operators. And uh, yeah, so no call scene. So okay, so we're a little bit better here. Um, uh, maybe I don't need it as like, instead let's actually just output the zero all on its own. And then I don't have to worry about assigning the check for it. Like I just output the zero and then work through the algorithm. Since A is null the first time through, nothing is really output. So it's effectively skipping it over in, in a loop. And you start like, yeah, you, you start playing with these. All right, so how do we not initialize the B at the beginning? All right, so here's the same thing, but I'm checking, okay, if, if B is not initialized, I use the null coalescing to actually, you know, give me the one instead. So I can skip the, 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 the B initialization. Um, all right, so here, uh, oh, so okay, so, so here instead of doing like the deconstruction, I move the assignment to A more inline. So it's like B needs A plus B. If I need to get the value of B into A, if I need to use the old value before I do that. So here I'm actually in line, I'm like, return the A value, assign B to A, but give that value the operation. And I've saved, you know, two more, a couple more characters just by like shoving those more in line. Um, and then, then maybe I can juggle things around because, so I also like swapped where I'm outputting the, the A, right? So let's, okay, so maybe we don't even need that because where it's in the loop, I kind of, through trial and error, I'm like, oh, I can just use the B at this point because we haven't added anything in there yet. And if I'm just doing this, I'm back to the point where, well, if, what if I just output this when I do the assignment? So then I put the parentheses around here, so I've basically removed a value that I'm outputting using the parentheses instead to save, you know, effectively one character, but I save it nonetheless. And now we're tight, okay, so let's remove these spaces. Like I left the spaces in to make it maybe readable, but as we dive in uh, next, and actually like remove the white space, I'm down to this monster of like 29 spaces that if I started with this, I couldn't tell you what it's doing. <laughs> But walking through and getting to that point, um, um, I'm now like 29 characters for the Fibonacci. And that's not the fastest solution. Um, this is my fastest solution. So go ahead and try to you know, uh, uh, beat me on this one. But this is as tight as I've gotten this one. And I know, I'm like, man, I feel like, I feel like this might be the heavy one, but I don't know. And it's like, and so when I'm looking at the solution, I'm like, I feel like there's too many characters in here. Like once it's small, like, that feels expensive. And, and that's how, yeah, I approach iterating and tying down um, to these nice, tighter, smaller solutions. Um, how many characters is the shortest solution? Yeah, let's go over and take a, take a peek. Twenty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fibonacci is right here. Yeah, 27. And I'm at, I guess I'm at 29. Is that my latest? Yeah. Yeah, I'm at 29. So like there's, and, that, and that's the nuance. It's like, am I, is it like one character I can shave in my current algorithm or I'd take the wrong approach entirely and have to come back to save those. You know, it's like, um, in fact, I think I s took another more like uh, computer science-y approach, like with arrays. Like, okay, maybe if I put stuff in a large array, as I work through it, I put the values in there and then I output it. Like that's one thought process I had. And I explored it, it didn't pan out. Like, okay, I mean, that's already a lot of characters. But like, all right, well, what if we just shorten the array, right? If I do, so I need the zero one for my math logic to work but the rest of it can be all zeros, right? So we've already seen like, okay, I could pre-populate this. And then as I was thinking through it, I'm like, okay, so it's very computer science-y. We got lots of variables, you know, I minus one, minus two to, to reference off where I'm at, but it's effectively running through the whole thing and grabbing the values behind it, adding them together and putting it in and working its way down the chain. The, um, but then I realized, like, actually, I don't actually need to pre-build this array. Maybe I can just like 
as I'm running through it, grow it, like plus equals. Like you don't use plus equals when you're going through loops because it's a memory hog and it takes, it, it slows down its performance hit, right? But I don't care in code golf. Like I can be, as long as it doesn't time out on me, I can use the slow, ugly memory, you know, abusing tricks as long as it still runs. Um, I've had some problems that ran too long. So it, there's a third way uh, that's taught with Fibonacci is like recursive, where you got this function that you call to give me the last two values that calls the function twice to give you the last two that calls, like there's a recursive way to do this, which is a way to make characters for me to squeeze in there. Like even just writing the word function is, it, it, I'm already after the bad, the bad start, right? Um, but even once you get to like just the 30 characters in, it's running too long for this challenge and it, and, and it kicks you out. So it's, telling, it's basically telling you, yeah, find a faster way. But, um, but now I thought, so but my thought process, right? I don't need to pre-build the array. Maybe I just append it as I go, and we'll cheat and use this. And I'm looking at this more, I'm like, oh, you want know actually this i minus one and i minus two, like, that's silly. I could actually just do the, the, the reverse index, right? Negative one and negative two tells me the last item, the second to last item. And as soon as I did that, you can realize, you know what? I don't need that i reference anymore. Like, before, it was important because the math was using it. And once I got rid of it, I could say, oh, now let's find a different way to do this loop. And we fall back into dropping the for loop down to something like this. So all of a sudden, as soon as I didn't need that one variable, I got to toss out that entire, you know, the, the, the entire uh, overhead piece of it. And now we're down to 43. We remove the white space and inline it. I'm like 36 and still too long, right? And this is one of those where you get stuck here, like all right, then we got to back all the way up and find another approach to dive down and back into these challenges. But each one was just a creative exploration of what PowerShell does in a nice, you know, computer science or a scientific method type of way. Like, what would happen if I do this? Like, no, nope, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. I did not expect that to work. Like, that's where these these things come in. Is like, I have to try that because it's too long, and then uh, something kind of jumps out at you. So, there's like, a, you know a good preview peek into exploring these problems, you know, like kind of the how um, I will whittle, whittle, whittle these down. And you're right, the, the, the day of the week, I definitely didn't think of get date until I gone through all the work with the date time, et cetera. Like, that's just the path my mind was on when I went there. And then I looked at them like, okay, now that's the expensive piece. And that just from it, I'm gonna take a little bit better look at get date. And sure enough, that's exactly what I needed. So. Excellent. I think that's it for my examples here. I suppose any uh, feedback questions? Yes. I don't. I didn't see any mention of like if statements versus switch statements. Do you have a preference at all, or maybe to use one versus the other? Yeah. So switch is just too many characters. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you start. These are something you can almost start throwing out right away because I just know to do switch as long as now. So. We can get really ugly in uh, code golf. And I don't know if I have a quick example in my fizz buzz. So this is almost a scenario, right? It's like if I have fizz buzz is the adage where if it's, um, you know, give me the numbers one through 100. If it's, you know, multiple of five, give me buzz. Multiple of three, give me fizz, fizz buzz if it's, if it's both. And I'm using lots of like, you know, if clauses in here. And I think, let me jump, if I can find where I'm talking about it. Um, there was an old school way of doing ternary operators. All right, so here I'm doing stuff outside the assignment. All right, so we have, like I said, okay, so we have the ternary operator in PowerShell 7. So I, I can get, you know, my operators there. Um, yeah, yeah I, had a whole, I had a whole story here. But there's an old way we used to do ternary, which was give me an array and I'll index into that with my expression. And we can whittle it down. And so if I need true or false, that's one thing. And if I just need false, like I, I can flip it, but that, that's how we see the ternary was we'd index in. Because if it's a short array, if false, so if I get my value to indicate one for fizz, or sorry, zero for fizz, anything else, one, I'd get a null because right, it's passing in the array. And I, and I could index in um, this. So basically, this is, this is being like an if false. So this thing, if my expression is false, I can get just the value. 
and I think I whittled it down to um, tighter. So there's a way, I'm not even using the word if anymore, I'm doing expressions to pull out values. And this is, this is a key part of my final solution when I got there on, on FizzBuzz. So um, uh, this was the demo I ran through last year. So the whole thing is in my previous year's talk from start to finish and we kind of explored all these fun type things. Excellent. Well, I think we are right at time. So uh, here's my bio stuff, which most of you hopefully might recognize me from my blog. And then thank our sponsors again. And then the session reviews. Please make sure you're feeding those back or you uh, giving us those feedback. Like, I really appreciate the feedback from you. Like, even if you, if you don't like it or you do like it, just knowing that you enjoyed the session, like, you know, um, just reminds me, like, you know, why, why I'm doing this, right? So, yeah, give, give your session speakers their, their feedback. All right. Thank you.